Good evening. You're watching PBS 39. I'm your host, Tony Kayumi, and this is Healthline Women's Health. Our topic of conversation this evening is miscarriage, and our guest expert is Dr. Jeffrey Cly. He's an OBGYN and is here to answer any questions that you might have about the topic. Very easy to do. Just call in by dialing the number you see on the screen at any time throughout tonight's show. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Could you start us off by telling us why miscarriages occur? Sure. Miscarriage is, is something I wanted to talk about tonight, and, and mainly as a result of seeing some patients who have suffered with recurrent miscarriage and realizing that there's a lot of new things that we can do to prevent them. And there's, unfortunately, some in the medical community hasn't heard of some of the new newest changes and newest ways of preventing them from happening. Um, and they usually occur, um, and historically we thought they occurred mostly from genetic changes where the sperm and the egg fertilized, but there was a mismatch. The genes didn't match up. And we thought that was the majority of the causes and that we couldn't do much about that. And in the last 10, 5, and even 2 years ago, we've learned there's actually things that occur um, that we can fix before the um, change occurs. And sometimes the changes in the mother is a mutation that she may have that we've just discovered and we can affect the uh, and fix the problem before it, it happens to the baby. So, for instance, if a woman has had repeated miscarriages and uh, wants to try getting pregnant again, are there some things, steps that can be taken prior to even trying to conceive again? Yes, absolutely. And this is exactly what happened. A lady came in and she had had uh, four miscarriages and she came in from another physician and this had happened several years ago and she told me that her doctor had just said, I'm sorry, you just never can have children. And I, it, my heart was broken and I, I checked some things on her and found out that she actually had a blood clotting disorder. And it was all we needed to do was to put her on some baby aspirin and some heparin, a blood thinner, and she was able to carry her next pregnancy to term and take home a beautiful, healthy baby. So other issues besides the blood clotting factor that you mentioned, what are some of the testings that can be done to determine what some of the causes might be and some of the preventative measures that can be taken? Sure, there's, there's a number of causes and in general they're um, from immune reactions to genetic changes to blood clotting disorders to infections um, to environmental risk. Um, into uterine um, anomalies or different type of uterine uh, anatomic problems. Now in regards to the type of tests that are taken, can you talk about maybe a series of tests or a battery of tests that are done to zero in on the cause? Sure. Um, the battery of tests that, that will look for the um, biggest kind of bang for your buck, because the insurances prefer to use a series of tests where do the first series if you don't find anything, go ahead and move to the second less likely series. And usually it's called a, a habitual miscarriage panel. And most of it will look at immune reactions or problems. Uh, lupus is one, um, or, and the blood clotting problems. Uh, factor five is one maybe people have heard in the press lately, which deal with increased clots at the placenta that kind of turn off the blood flow to the pregnancy. Now, I know right now we're specifically talking about female issues, but a male is certainly a contributing factor uh, in pregnancies and perhaps in miscarriages in some instances. Could you just touch upon that lightly? I know that's not your specific field. No, sure. No, we see that a lot also. In, in getting pregnant, um, many times the male factor of, of having a hard time getting pregnant is just as important as the female factor. And it, it could be as far as males go that there's some problems with the amount of, of semen or, the, or they may have a missing duct that won't allow the semen to come out. Um, they could have a chromosomal abnormality that was passed down from their parents, even though they're entirely normal, that the chromosome missing won't allow the uh, wife or the, their partner to get um, a fertilized egg. And we can identify those by checking to see with different labs if those are the cases and then move to fix it. And then after pregnancy occurs, some of the factors could be an inherited genetic change. Uh, can you also touch upon uh, low motility and low morphology of sperm? Exactly, exactly. The, the sperm that come out, there's millions of them, three to five million sperm come out, at, and one of those lucky sperms makes it. And in the process of trying to get to the egg, the way the, the female reproductive system is set up, is a lot of those sperms have to kind of huddle ahead of the first, of the, uh, the one that makes it. And they kind of will um, be sacrificed by uh, 
from paving the way for the one sperm. The motility refers to the ability of a sperm to swim in, let's say, a straight direction, just to make it simple. And the morphology is how many of those um, three to five million sperm are normal. Some of them might have a short tail, so they can't swim as much, or some of them might not have the stamina because they don't have the energy component in them, so they can't make it as far. So there has to be a certain amount of uh, motility and morphology for those sperm to get to the egg and then for one of them to get through and fertilize the egg. Now, a lot of women are having children later in life in, in this current generation versus the generation before them. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the factor that age plays uh, with women and their fertility and miscarriage rates? As a woman ages, um, the chances of getting pregnant get a little less and the risk of miscarriage goes up a little bit higher. And generally we, we see that, that magical age of 27 where it's best if you could plan life and it worked the way you wanted, which usually doesn't happen that way for us, that if you could try to have a pregnancy before 27, but if you're in a situation where either by choice, you, your career, education, or just um, not in a relationship position, then um, from 27 to 35, the risk is generally thought of to be fairly low. But after 35, it is a little bit more um, a higher risk of getting pregnant and having the chance of maybe an abnormality happening and the most common being the risk of Down syndrome or a spinal cord problem goes up after 35 and once uh, a woman becomes uh, age 40 which is as uh, a very young age as I'm approaching that age um, the risk goes up higher so but it's still possible and a lot of women will choose to have some testing done early. Now in regards to um an older age, say 40 or, or 40 plus. I know that sometimes there are issues with the eggs um, mm -hmm. or perhaps um, hormonal levels, uterine lining, if you could mm -hmm. go a little more into depth about that. Yeah, exactly, because a, a woman's uh, hormones change and the hormones will prepare the lining of the uterus and they will um, determine whether there's a very good ovulation or, or, and whether even they have more than one ovulation dependent if they're on medication to assist with ovulation. And so if those hormones fluctuate, it could make um, many things not work properly. A million things have to work right to, to go from conception to um, birth. It's, just, it's a miracle in itself. And so if one step doesn't work right, maybe the lining of the uterus isn't thick enough, that could cause a problem. Um, or if the ovulation isn't strong enough, that the motility of the sperm or even the, the motility of the fallopian tubes pulling that fertilized egg into the uterus isn't strong enough, that could cause issues. Now in regards to um, miscarriages, perhaps some early warning signs so that one perhaps might be prevented before it actually happens? Yes, um, definitely cramping and spotting or bleeding could be a warning sign. Now it's very common to get cramping when you're first pregnant because the uterus is growing and that growing causes cramping because it's stretching. And it's very common to have some spotting. Many times the spotting is from the cervix and not from the pregnancy. So usually what I, I tell my patients is definitely call us and let us know and we'll try and talk with you if it's on the weekend or nighttime over the phone or day and say okay it sounds like it could be uh, a challenge, we definitely want you to come in and be evaluated. But many times it, with it just a little bit of spotting, maybe after intercourse or after a, a recent pap smear, that's usually from the cervix and not from the pregnancy, especially if there's not much cramping or pain associated with that. Now, women who perhaps have had a history of miscarriage and are now pregnant again, what extra precautions might be taken in regards to perhaps uh, more sonograms than normal or more checking of hormone levels or additional hormones to make sure the levels are right, if you could touch on that. Sure, and I'm, I'm gonna go into why I became a doctor in the first place a little bit because I'm gonna get myself in trouble with the insurance companies as I talk about this. But I came into medicine to try and help people. And what I found out in certain situations, and this is one of them that I have a big frustration with, that we are taught and trained that when a person has a miscarriage, we don't do anything on the first one. We tell them it's gonna be okay. We should not do anything on the second one. We should tell them it's going to be okay. And then on the third miscarriage, oh, maybe there's a problem. Let's spend the insurance money to find out what's going on. And I, I have a big disagreement with that. We need to not kind of put women down. We need to elevate women. That's why I'm in women's care. And women deserve to have an evaluation 
at any point it's necessary, not just to try and save money so we don't spend extra labs. So usually what I would recommend for all patients is talk with your doctor if you're thinking about getting pregnant. So maybe we could identify some family history that would alert us to potential problems and we could start looking at that point in time. And if you had one miscarriage, um, it's definitely important to talk to your doctor before you get pregnant the second time. And again, look for problems. And your doctor should be able to check some of those labs, at least the initial round of labs, to see if something could be wrong. And I think that's the best way to go, that we stay ahead of the game and not just kind of blow it off as historically has happened, because we used to not n know that we could do anything about this. And unfortunately, it was just as early as 40 years ago that we didn't ha even have a pregnancy test. We could tell we had to kind of inject a rabbit, and if the rabbit lived or died was how you knew if you were pregnant or not. So a lot of the, that misconception, that old time thought was, don't come in to see us until you're you know, three months along because there's nothing we can do about it, still exists. And that's not the case anymore. We can make some big changes. So I think talk to your doctor. If you know family or friends who have suffered with this, have them come and see a specialist. Have them come and see somebody who, who deals with this. And if your doctor's not sure, ask your doctor, can, can you check some things out or could I check with someone else just to make sure that everything's okay. In regards to the different types of miscarriage, um, can you sort of give us some details and list those different types? There's, um, the most common is um, spontaneous miscarriage. It's a miscarriage less than 20 weeks and something happens along the way where the, the pregnancy and the, and the fetus can't continue. And so usually the heart stops beating. Usually there, it's not that we believe associated with pain because there's a process and it's kind of like everything kind of stops and kind of like the baby goes to sleep because the blood pressure stops and things slow down. Um, that's the most common type. Usually if a person has heard the heartbeat um, at 10 or 11 weeks, it's, it's rare that a miscarriage is going to occur. Um, usually it would happen more likely in the first few weeks then second likely would be before seven weeks because the heart is formed around six to seven weeks. And then again, the next spot would be 13 weeks. And after 13 weeks, most people um, it, it will, will do really well and are past the main concern point. But we always worry though until we get to the point when we can deliver the baby and it will be okay, which is usually around 26 to 28 weeks. So we'll, some women who are high risk, we'll keep them on high surveillance until they actually deliver. Now in regards to um, miscarriages that do not complete, uh, what are some of the precautions that are taken to uh, ensure that the woman doesn't have an infection from whatever fetal remains might still be inside? Um, the, the, we, we talk about fever, um, pain, bleeding, chills, nausea, vomiting, um, and we, we talk to women about their choices at that point in time. And usually the choice is to wait and let things happen naturally, which could be as early as a few days, or it could be a few weeks, depending on the situation. A or it could be that uh, they would choose to have a DNC, where we would kind of remove the pregnancy under anesthesia, kind of let their uterus start going back to normal. Um, and I find that most women choose that option. And um, you know, having uh, f some family history of some challenges and being kind of the, the relative on the side with some of my family members who've gone through this has allowed me to see you know, how it is on that side of the field. And there's a lot of emotions and there's a lot of guilt and sadness and grief. And so a lot of people and women say, I just want to do the DNC because I need some finality. I, I can't just wait for weeks and weeks and go to work with, with this going on in my body and not be able to tell anybody, because many people, they keep this very private. And so I find a lot of people do a DNC, and, that, and I, I try to work with the patient and whatever they prefer I want to help them with. And usually a patient can go back to normal in a few days, at least physically. Mentally, there is a grieving process. And it usually won't cause any problems, so they can try to get pregnant again. Now, if um, it is an incomplete miscarriage, uh, are there some oral medications that perhaps might be used uh, first on a trial run to see if that would complete the miscarriage prior to having a DNC? Um, there, there is a, a medication that um, will try to induce the 
um, delivery process. Most of us don't use those. Usually the uh, doctors who do terminations are comfortable because they use those medicines um, in that scenario. So most of us will um, not um, give the medication just because we haven't had the uh, training with it and um, it kind of does still leave open the possibility of some bleeding and cramping at home and that could turn into a, a situation that might need even a blood transfusion. So we don't want to also leave them at home and, and be worried and scared and have things happen that could harm them too. We do have a call around hold so we're going to move to the phone lines where Katie's waiting for us. Hi Katie. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. I have a question about your thyroid levels and how that can affect your fertility rates and also your chances of miscarriage. Thanks for your call, Katie. Uh, Katie, thank you very much. And I did not mention that, but that's something I've, I work on my practice on a great deal. And the thyroid is important to regulate the whole body, the metabolism, fertility for sure, menstrual cycles, weight gain, weight loss, fatigue, um, your bowels, your skin, your hair. And recently, the there have been changes in the recommendations on thyroid testing and thyroid medication. And this is very important because I've, I've come up across this and I'm trying to educate, as I've been educated myself recently, that what I was taught in med school um, several years ago, 15 years ago, is different than what's being taught right now. And what that is, is I'll, I'll give you just a gist of it, and I, I hope people talk about this. A TSH level of greater than three with symptoms should be treated and that means your your levels of your thyroid in your body are too low the general knowledge had been a th s level tsh level of five or greater should be treated and what why that's important is i have a lot of women coming in who maybe are not trying to become pregnant um, or maybe they are and they're saying i'm gaining weight i'm fatigued or my periods are off and i can't get pregnant but my doctor says my thyroid's normal and I look at the thyroid and maybe it's 3.5. Well, truly, that's actually a thyroid that's becoming abnormal. It's on its way to five, which is the abnormal range. The symptoms have started. So I would recommend checking that level, talking with your doctor, making sure they're up to the, on to the latest recommendations. Because many times you treat that person and they'll be able to get pregnant, they'll have normal cycles, they'll lose weight, they won't feel fatigued, and they'll finally feel like themselves that they used to know two, three years ago. Sally is up next. Hi, Sally. Yes. You can go ahead with your question. I would like to know, I had a hysterectomy. Do I still need a pap smear? Um, the, yes, I would recommend still having a pap smear. And it depends on kind of your history, Sally, and, and what your relationship status is. Now, it's, it's a, um, it very important to go in every year to have a bimanual exam where the doctor checks inside the ovaries or if there's no ovaries, checks for any abnormalities in that area, and a breast exam. The pap smear portion is where they take the Q-tip and just take a sample of the cells at the top of the vagina or the cervix. And usually I would recommend doing that for a couple years if you've had normal paps your whole life and you're either uh, married or with the same partner then doing that for a couple years after to make sure everything returns to normal after a hysterectomy. And then you could go to having pap smears every three years after that, but still every year having an annual exam. There have been some changes and some people are saying you may not never need a pap smear again, but I do have some patients who are in their 80s and have um, vaginal or cervical precancerous cells. So I don't think it's a good idea to never have a pap smear like there have been suggestions, but every so often would be okay. Thanks for your call, Sally. Now we touched upon a lot of medical issues. If we could touch upon some lifestyle issues in regards to environmental causes, um, substance abuse, things along those lines, that might also increase a person's risk for miscarriage. Well, thank you. It, very important. And being healthy and eating healthy and having exercise are extremely important because those lend to a higher risk of diabetes and then some hormonal abnormalities. And so that can affect the pregnancy and can affect the, um, if there's any abnormalities or problems with the baby even. Having high blood sugars can increase your risk for a heart defect in, in the baby. And so we want to definitely get those under control. Uh, smoking is something that is definitely a person should try to stop. And, and usually it's very hard to stop cold turkey. And we don't recommend using Shantix or some of the other um, withdrawal kits when you're pregnant. So it is okay to cut down slowly. I, I tell my patients, cut down by one a week. 
And if you can commit to one a week, you're going to be able to do it. And many people can do that. Also, alcohol, very important to stop alcohol. We know if you drink six drinks a day, it'll cause problems in the baby. We don't know about one, two, three, or four, or five. So in general, we say, please don't drink, because we just don't know what happens if you have one a day. Now, I've heard some um, information in regards to caffeine, that it can lower your chances of fertility as well as cause miscarriage problems. Could you address that issue? Sure, and that came out uh, several months ago, I believe. And, and caffeine is a type of a stimulant, and it can affect blood pressure, and it can reduce uh, blood flow and reduce um, different types of um, things in your body, uh, tubal flow and uh, uterine issues. So it's important to keep caffeine in moderation. And I usually tell patients one or two cups of coffee a day or one or two pops a day would be okay and that's not in excess and that, that shouldn't cause any problems with the pregnancy or the baby. More, the biggest problem I see is pop. It's people are drinking maybe three, four, five, six, seven Cokes or Mountain Dews through their day and don't realize how many calories and caffeine they're really getting. So it's really important to kind of just think of your diet and look at see how much you're, you're getting and maybe you're getting 3,000 calories and pop a day and that's why you're gaining weight. That's very common. I see that all the time. What are your thoughts on prenatal vitamins even prior to getting pregnant and of course the importance of them once you are? Absolutely. The Most of us in America don't eat the healthiest diet. I'm guilty myself. Um, and so without the, with the faster foods and the processed foods, we don't get all the natural vitamins and minerals. So prenatal vitamins before you get pregnant are extremely important. And the spinal cord closes in the first 21 days. And most people don't realize they're pregnant until right around that time. The folic acid that's in a prenatal vitamin, everybody's heard us talk about, helps the spinal cord close properly and grow properly. And so if you can get it before you get pregnant, you'll make sure that those first three weeks or, or when it's very critical, the baby's going to be okay. Now in regards to exercise, um, the lifting perhaps of heavy objects? Mm -hmm. it, actually, great question. It's very important to continue your exercise program. And if you haven't exercised, it's okay to start a program, just start in moderation. It's going to keep your muscles in, in tone, in tune, so that when you're trying to go through labor and deliver the baby, you're going to do a better job, be more effective, you're going to have less um, problems after the delivery if your muscles are in shape. Aerobics are fine, weightlifting is fine. You want to watch the abdominal type of crunches or exercises and you want to keep your heart rate less than 130 and drink a lot of water. And you'll actually increase your energy throughout the whole pregnancy by doing that. And if we could talk a little bit more about other um, safety issues perhaps when you are pregnant in regards to um, environmental factors that you should avoid like pollutants of a certain nature or chemicals, uh, hot baths, things along those lines. Sure. A hot bath is okay. If it, I usually say if it's your bath water hot. But when it becomes jacuzzi hot, much, much too hot. And so recommend watching those. Um, sun tanning is in is okay and as well as tanning beds are okay as long as you're well hydrated and you do it in moderation the tanning beds in the Sun for that matter those rays only go skin deep I hear a lot of people saying my grandmother said it's gonna burn the baby it won't burn the baby if it would burn the baby it would also burn your uterus and your bowels and whatnot so it just goes skin deep so in moderation is okay hair chemicals are okay try to do them after the third I mean the, I'm sorry the first trimester just to be on the safe side because I'm not sure what everybody's using. They, I, they typically say I believe they don't hold as well, but I know a lot of women want that delivery picture to look as best as possible. You mentioned the emotional trauma that can result from miscarriages. Are you aware of perhaps any good books, websites, support groups? Yeah, absolutely. We have um, people in town here who support groups that just for this reason the um, Women's Health Center there's one at both hospitals uh, actually all three hospitals have great support systems there's many books available and y y we also have staff ready to help so if you're suffering through uh, miscarriage unfortunately talk to your nurse or your the, doc the, the doctor and they can put you in touch with the, any type of resource you feel comfortable with. Maybe you don't want to talk to somebody, maybe just something to read and they can give you that information. Now if someone has suffered a miscarriage but they are emotionally ready to try again, when is someone physically ready to try again? Physically ready, usually the body will um, deal with the miscarriage or have if someone has a DNC. Once the body has a complete cycle, 
So they go through one full cycle, which could be four to six weeks. Um, I usually have them wait an extra cycle just to be on the conservative side. And by two menstrual cycles, their body should be ready. A lot of people say at the first cycle, the body is saying, I am now ready. So I, yeah, I have had people get pregnant that first cycle and they've done fine. I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to PBS 39. Do you want to let you know what we have coming up for upcoming Healthline issues? We have cancer prevention with Marsha Prenguber, and that's with our cancer care episode. And then we also have another show coming up, Body Contouring with Dr. Kevin Burning, and that's with the Healthline Cosmetic Surgery. You are watching PBS 39. Have a great evening, and be sure to tune in for the next Healthline.